In a perfect world, insurance companies would always do the right thing. Yet in reality, the industry harbors a dirty little secret. People are giving them money for something they will never receive. What that really means is they're selling uncollectible insurance. Insurance companies rule our country. They control our banking. Look at AIG, too big to fail. They own Wall Street. They catch a virus and Wall Street has diarrhea for a week. And when interest rates fall and their investments earnings plummet, then they run to Congress and scream tort reform. Lawsuits are killing us, they scream, and those greedy trial lawyers are to blame by filing frivolous lawsuits and convincing ignorant juries to dole out obscene verdicts. But ironically, what you don't know until now is that insurance companies regularly and deliberately invite lawsuits whenever the cost and hassles for a third-party claimant look to exceed all potential for recovery. Rather than just doing the right thing, too many insurers prefer to play a game of litigation chicken, a frivolous lawsuit strategy in reverse. Don't like it? Sue me. Today, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines with Lynn Labor at the Lynn Labor Law Firm to explain for the first time ever on national TV, Disability Insurance Expose, what every employee needs to know about ERISA. And how nearly all employee benefit plans, funds, or programs that are organized to provide insurance, retirement, training, and other benefits are covered by ERISA. In fact, nearly all types of retirement plans you have access to through work are covered by ERISA. The Employment Retirement Security Act, ERISA for short, was passed by Congress in 1974 as an attempt to address widespread abuses in pension and retirement programs. In sum, workers were being promised lucrative retirement plans instead of salary increases, but when it came time to retire, the retirement plans suddenly disappeared. The act was hailed by its Senate sponsor as the greatest development in the life of the American worker since Social Security. It has instead become the genesis of massive injustice and bizarre judicial doctrines. It authorizes insurance companies to deny health, disability, and life insurance claims whenever they can find any possible basis to justify the denial. The language of ERISA is applied to all private sector employee benefit programs, including life, health, and disability insurance. To make matters worse, the remedies under ERISA just to obtain one's own insurance benefits are severely restricted. In fact, the American Association of Justice named these 10 worst insurance companies in America. ERISA contains the following restrictions whenever someone covered by ERISA tries to sue their insurance company. No right to a jury trial. In order to obtain benefits, the insured must prove that the insurance company's conduct was arbitrary and capricious. Even if the insured wins the lawsuit, he or she may still not get benefits. The court may simply send it back to the insurance company to reevaluate, that is, to find some other basis to deny the claim. There are no compensatory damages or punitive damages for wrongful conduct, no matter how egregious. In most cases, no right to submit any evidence except what is contained in the insurance company's file. In most cases, no right of the insured to testify. If one were to attempt to try to enforce these regulations, the insurance companies themselves cannot be sued. The insured would have to sue their own employer instead, but the employer has nothing to do with these regulations. And the nightmare of rules and regulations protecting the insurance companies and screwing the little guy go on and on. But perseverance and persistence can and sometimes win the day. And in this Insider Exclusive Network TV special, Lynn will explain how she gets justice for her clients. Throughout her career, Lynn has seen many innocent, hardworking people become victimized by their own insurance companies in the name of greed. And because of that, she is driven not only to get justice for these victims of injustice, but to make sure all policyholders get 100% what their insurance companies promised and what they paid for, plus get it without hassle and on time. Lynn has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in Wisconsin and across the nation. And she has built a substantial reputation nationwide by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. Her amazing courtroom skills 
and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide our clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Brookfield, Wisconsin. my great pleasure to introduce Lynn Labor to the show. Welcome to the show, Lynn. Thank you. Tell our audience a little bit about your practice. What type of cases do you handle? I handle uh, disability pension cases, disability policy cases. I handle personal injury cases, workers' compensation cases, and social security disability cases. I only represent injured or disabled people, never insurance companies or corporations. You represent the little guy. That's right. And some of the cases, for example, um, workers' compensation cases and personal injury cases, what are the cases that you generally find yourself involved with? A lot of them, um, a lot of our Wisconsin workers have back injuries. Yes. We still have a great deal of production um, type of companies. In other words, they're in manufacturing. And basically what you see in production or manufacturing is body parts start to wear out from everyday exposure. It's not so much just a traumatic injury, although there are those also. But a lot of them are low back injuries, lifting, carrying all day, assuming certain positions, and other, a lot of bending and twisting. Right, and you're in a state where you have a governor, Scott Walker, who tends to favor um, big business and big business doesn't really like to, they're your, you know, your opposition, they don't really like to take care of their workers too well, do they? No, they do not. So you have to fight to get some sort of compensation for You them, have right? to fight quite a bit. Okay. Um, today we're here talking about a bad faith disability case, aren't we? It's a case under the uh, Federal ERISA Act, yes, the Employees Retirement Act. An Income Security Act. Yeah, and although we cannot, dis the case has been settled, and although we cannot discuss the name of the individual that you represented, tell our audience some of the facts of the case, the general facts of the case, and some of the problems you had. I represented a gentleman who worked for a large uh, bulk metal material handler, and he worked all day with aluminum, copper, brass, terillium, beryllium, and uh, the materials would come in and he lifted, carried about 60% of the day. This gentleman worked from eight to 12 hours per day. He worked as many as seven days a week. He always performed the functions of a general laborer and he had started there in 2002. And in January of 2013, he was unable to continue work for his low back. He had a low back disability. He had been taking narcotic medication for years to make it through the day. And he wasn't that old, was he? Very young. He was yeah. born in 1977, yeah. and he started working at uh, the material handler in 2002, and as of 2013, January, couldn't work anymore. So he was not even 40 years old, and he, when he couldn't work anymore, he actually had back surgery three months. He had back surgery in April of 2013, stopped working in January of 2013. He was found disabled by the Social Security Administration and was found disabled by his doctors. He completed a, an in-depth functional capacity evaluation, which the specialist that performed that evaluation said that if he worked, he could not work more than four hours per day. Yeah and he couldn't lift over 10 pounds. So I, I want to interject here. Sure. There's a lot of evidence to show that he was clearly disabled, couldn't do this job anymore. Medically and vocationally, and also the federal government had so found him disabled. he did the natural thing, what did he do? He applied for initially short-term disability under the, employee, the ERISA Act, Employee Retirement and Income Security Act, which is a federal act. And the short-term disability insurer found him disabled. 
Mm -hmm. So he received short-term disability. And that lasts how long? That lasted six months. Okay. And toward the end of the six-month period, he applied for long-term disability, and he applied for the long-term disability through the same company that administered and paid the short-term disability. Yeah. So it's the same company. Right. And that company is a, an insurance company that is a part of his employee package when he went to work for the company, right? Sure. He was paying into it, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Okay, so he was entitled to it, right? He would be entitled to it whether or not he contributed to yeah. the premium, the policy premium. So the six months... By federal law. Yeah, the six months short-term disability, you get the payments, that goes away, what happens now? Same company, what happens? They deny him. And why do they deny him? Well, they move the target. They give different reasons. Initially, they said that um, while he was getting short-term disability, they classified his job as being heavy. In other words, it was heavy work. Right. And there's a dictionary of occupational titles that states that heavy work is lifting 100 pounds or more per day. Mm -hmm. So for short-term disability, they classified his job as he heavy, found him disabled. Yeah. Same company, when he applies for the long-term disability, now classifies that job yes. as light, exertional. So they, what they're saying then is we're denying be you because your job is classified as light and we believe you're capable mm -hmm. of lifting 20 to 50 pounds. Despite the medical evidence that says otherwise, right? Absolutely. Okay. The most any doctor or healthcare professional would allow this gentleman to lift was 10 pounds. Right. So now your client is not getting any money. He feels he has been, you know, cornered, shut off. He comes to you, correct? Correct. And what do you do? Well, what I, it's very important for people to get to lawyers very, very early because the uh, federal- Even before they file short-term disability? As soon as they file, right. or if they're contemplating filing, yeah. yes. Because There's you, a, from your experience, you know that a lot of these insurance companies, they may give you short-term disability, but they're darn sure probably not going to give you long-term disability, right? Well, that's correct. And okay. there's also offsets. I mean, we can yeah. talk about, if you want to talk about that at a later point, exactly okay. what do they stand to gain from these insurance companies. Yeah. But let's, for instance, in this case that we're referring to, where he's granted short-term, he's denied long-term. Initially, they say, we believe you can perform your occupation or 80% mm -hmm. of the duties of your occupation which now is classified as light, which they admitted in the beginning was heavy. So that was one of the targets. Um, and what I was saying about having somebody get to lawyers early in the process mm -hmm. is once the insurance company has their record and they've documented things in their record, when you get into federal court, all these cases must be brought in federal court, you cannot change the record. So you want to get in all the evidence in your client's favor very quickly, any vocational evidence, evidence of job duties, and all of your medical evidence. So when it's being reviewed in federal court, yeah. you've got the evidence there to attempt to prove that the insurance company acted arbitrary and capricious. Right, so there are some procedural hurdles that when you're dealing with an ERISA policy that a client has to be aware of. And when you say getting in the evidence, had your client come to you uh, when he first filed for short-term disability, the evidence you're talking about is that the insurance company's um, factual interpretation of his job would have been a heavy lifting job as opposed to a light lifting job later on. Right. Were you able to insert you know, or get into the court record the fact that they had classified it as a heavy job before? Sure, you certainly. Were. And I had also submitted a summary of my client's job duties. Yes. And that was submitted to the insurer. Had it not been submitted before the appeal process had run on the insurance companies, the insurance company's internal appeal uh, procedures, 
if that process had run, no, it would never get into federal court. And the federal court couldn't take a look at it. Yeah. Because all they're doing in federal court, all a judge can do, yeah. now this is set by federal law, yeah. is review the insurance company's actions based on their policy. And the standard of review is governed in the policy. And the standard of review that almost every insurance company writes in their policy mm -hmm. is one of great deference. In other words, a federal judge can find numerous things that he wouldn't agree with that yeah. the insurance company had done, mm -hmm. but he can't overturn what they've done unless, because he owes them deference, yeah. unless he finds that their actions were arbitrary and capricious. And those are key words, They're arbitrary very key. and capricious. Legally. In other words, they went way over the top, correct? Right, and really what that boils down to is that they had no reasonable basis. Yes. So if an insurance company had any reasonable basis, a federal court judge is bound to defer to their decisions. Yeah. Now in this specific case, and in a lot of these cases, the insurance company not only is the one that's paying the benefits, but they're also determining whether or not the client gets benefits. Yeah, yeah. And they're, that's they're an the adherent. judge and the jury. Absolutely. Okay. And yet, we have to defer to them. Now, yeah, if you're the one paying, yeah. how many people are you going to find eligible? And by the way, these ERISA cases, when they're tried in federal court, are not tried in front of a jury, are they? No. You they have to be tried in front of a judge. Correct. So you cannot get the sympathy of you know regular, everyday, average people to identify with your client, right? Right. ERISA has taken away uh, an individual's right to a trial by a jury. Yeah. Okay, and what further happened after you filed this claim with an insurance company? Well, and how long did this case take to resolve, by the way? This case, we were on a pretty tight deadline set by the judge, and it didn't take as long as some cases could to resolve yeah. because it settled. Yeah. And it was in the client's best interest at that time. But if the law was more favorable to begin with, mm -hmm. then these cases and this case in particular, would settle for a fair amount. Right. See, what's being fought here is very little in benefits. Now, my client, who worked for the manufacturer, was working a lot of overtime. To start with, the insurance company said that we're going to take your gross salary, but that's not based on overtime. Mm -hmm. So they figured that his monthly benefit amount was under $2,900, even though this individual could have been earning or was earning four to six thousand dollars a month with overtime. Yeah. Then what all the insurance companies write into their policy is that they offset any workers' compensation payments or social security disability payments. Yeah. So we have somebody now is only getting sixty percent of their hourly rate on a forty hour week per and week. Not basis. including the overtime. Not, not including, including the overtime, right? And then Mr. Uh, this client got was getting Social Security disability benefits, so they offset that or deducted it. Let's say the benefit amount would have been for long-term disability two thousand nine hundred. They offset the approximate one thousand five hundred per month that he was getting for Social Security disability. And what's even more outrageous mm -hmm. is they offset the Social Security disability that his four children were getting per month. Now his net benefit was under $219 per month. Okay. And they so, can do that legally. They can do that legally. It's written into the policy right. and the federal government by the passage of the ERISA Act, yes, allows them to do that. Yeah. So in other words, what they, what the way the law is written is they are going to offset any other payments you're getting from any other place so that they're, the brunt of what they have to pay is far less than what you thought it might have been. And it's very difficult for these disabled people to find lawyers because they, they can't to afford to pay them hourly. Yeah. Now, if his net benefit from the long-term disability was $219 per month, Yeah. And he's got a family, he's got a wife, and he's got four children. So you have a family of six that are trying to live on Social Security disability. Yeah. So attorneys, that, such as I, that handle these cases, we're going to charge on a contingency fee basis. Sure. So when you ask how long does the case take to settle, 
it gets very important for plaintiffs or a disabled person's lawyer. When you settle a case like this one, do you settle it based on that, that number, like you mentioned, 200 and some odd dollars? Is that the basis of how you settle the case? Well, you have to. I mean, you have to determine what the value of the case is. Yeah. And for him, until his fourth child reached the age of 18, yeah. his monthly rate would not go up. Yeah. So you have to, and you have to extrapolate that into the future. Yeah. What were some of the unique challenges in this particular case? Well, another issue was uh, we did have the medical and the vocational evidence in where a reasonable insurer would have found in my client's favor. Yeah. And on the second appeal, they sent my client's medical records and filed to a doctor, uh, Dr. Pushkin, mm -hmm. and for a review. And the insurance policy provides that if they're going to send, if they're going to have their own medical, the insurance company's own medical doctor evaluate a file, that that doctor perform, number one, a physical examination yeah. of the insured or the client, and number two, that they be licensed to practice medicine in the state in which the disabled person resides. Yeah. Well, in this case, Cigna, C-I-G-N-A, um, sent the file to a Dr. Pushkin yeah, in Texas. Who wrote, in Texas. Yeah. He I mean, they know a, the law, though. They know the law. So why are they sending it to a doctor in another state? The doctor wasn't even in that state. <laughs> really? All right. The file was sent to a company called Genex, which is G-E-N-E-X. Right. And Dr. Pushkin did what's called a peer review, which means nothing other than is he reviewed the file and he wrote a report. He never saw my client, number one, violation right there of the insurance policy because he was supposed to do a physical exam. Yeah. Number two, he wasn't licensed to practice medicine in Wisconsin. Right. Then we found out that he wasn't licensed to practice medicine in Texas. Right. And that's where the report was written. So now, where that, was he licensed to practice? Well, I think it was out in Maryland, yeah. if it's now, the same doctor. Now, when you're gathering all this information, is this, is this kind of proving this arbitrary and capricious uh, behavior, conduct by the company? If it's in the record, yeah. and yes, in this case, it was in the record. Okay. Yes, it, it, it's helping. And by proving that, how does that benefit your client? Well, the most you can really expect, or I could have expected in this one case that we've been talking about, yeah is that the judge would have found that they acted arbitrary. In other words, they didn't have a, uh, a reasonable explanation for de denying benefits. Yeah. And all the federal court judge could do at that point mm -hmm. is award the past due long-term disability from the date that he was eligible yeah. up until the date the judge reaches a decision. Yeah. Then he has to remand the file back down to the insurance company. Now, in a lot of these cases, the initial period of long-term disability will run for maybe a year or two years, and then they'll change the definition of disabled. The which, insurance company. Well, absolutely. It's written in the policy. The yeah. first year or two, the definition will be if you can't perform 80%, right. let's say, or all the material duties of your regular <laughs> occupation, They're you're changing disabled. the rules as they go. Two years later, they'll say you cannot be able to perform yeah. all the or 80% of the material duties of any yeah. occupation. And that's all legal for them to do. It's in their policy. Yeah. And yes, it's their policy is based on the Federal ERISA Act. Mm -hmm. And the employee has no input whatsoever into the terms of that policy. Mm -hmm. So it should not be legal. Mm -hmm. In a state action, we could bring claims and say that the policy is unconscionable. Yeah. It's void because you're never going to pay up, but not in federal. Yeah. Now, most people are unaware that um, almost all pension plans, almost all disability plans are governed under ERISA. Are they not? I believe that they are not aware of that, yeah. and they're not aware of the, and, and the please, jeopardy they face under that law. Yeah, and let's talk about that jeopardy. Okay. What, are, what should they know? Well, they should know that very quickly they have to document their disability medically, 
okay. by doctor's reports and they do need to be specific. Yes. In this case, for instance, a functional capacity evaluation was performed. That's in-depth testing of four hours by independent specialists mm -hmm. where they can say how long somebody can push or pull or finger or grasp out yeah. of an eight-hour workday right. or sit or stand. That's your best evidence. Those things, it takes a while to get those set up and to yeah. get the reports. They also want to get in vocational evidence. In yeah. other words, the best description of all of what your job duties were right. and weights. A lot of companies will say, for instance, in this case, the one that we've been talking about, the employer said they can't lift over 50 pounds. Well, yeah. my client lift on a, on a regular basis up to 130 pounds on yeah. his own. Yes. So the employer is going to give the insurance company what their generic job description is, or they're going to get an email or have a phone call yeah. with the employer. And the employer is going to say, they can't lift over 75 pounds, or they can't lift over 50 pounds. Yet all these guys are doing it, mm. and they're doing it on a daily basis. So you need to get all that evidence in yeah. very quickly. Okay, let me ask you this question. Let's say, in your particular case, you know, your client, let's say as they change the definition of what the job is supposed to be, let's say they moved it down to 10 pounds, for example. My question is, do they expect your client to go out and find another job with this definition, which, would be, which he would be able to do that job? No, they will impute or assume that he can get those jobs. And is that a reason to stop his disability payments? Oh, that is why they stop their disability payment, payments. They're, they're, the reality is quite a bit different. But what if he can't get a job? Well, you can't. You take a worker that's on a lot of narcotic medication yeah. because he's in a great deal of pain, Yeah. and he's now a middle-aged or an older worker that's only worked in a certain type of manufacturing. Yeah. A lot of my clients some of them don't even have high school diplomas, right. but they started working when they were 17 or 18. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Now the job market has changed. So will your client who's got work restrictions, whether or not on the medication, who's a little bit older, that doesn't have transferable skills to a new occupation, yeah. will that individual be able to get the job? Highly unlikely yeah. when there's a younger worker without work restrictions. Right. So the insurance company doesn't have to prove that they can get a job. Right. They take a look at the national economy and say, based on your job description, mm -hmm. there's 20,000 or 50,000 jobs. And not necessarily in your area. It right. doesn't have to be in it. So they look what, at the national economy. Yeah, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say you could get a job. The fact that you don't have a job is not our problem. Is that right? That's right. And, and then they stop the payments. And then they stop payments. Right. And this is all under ERISA. This is all under ERISA. Okay. Well, I mean, that's why we're doing this story because, you know, a lot of people are unaware until the you know what hits the fan. And then they realize, because I've seen this time and time again, they get approved for short term disability six months is up, same company denies. And when you talked about arbitrary and capriciousness, right, conduct, the company, the insurance company, is really only penalized by having to pay the back pay, right? Is that it? Pretty much. The federal there's no judge punitive can't, damages, no, right? No, no punitive ja damages. And yeah. you're lucky. There's it's no almost criminal. I mean, seriously, it's almost criminal. Well, <laughs> yes, it is. Now, it really is. You have a lot of folks that contact you to represent them. How do you select your cases? I mean, you must turn away some cases you'd like to, but you really don't have the time or they're not the right kind of cases. What cases do you like to take? I think I'm different than a lot of lawyers. I really, I'm all referral. Yeah. I've never advertised. Yeah. So um, clients come to me because they know someone that I've helped. Yeah or other attorneys refer cases to me, so it's rare that I turn away a case. It right. really is. But when they come to you, personal injury case, workers' compensation case, um, what, how do you really select the cases that you can handle? 
well, there's very few cases that I can if they're with, yeah. within my practice area. Yeah. But in, in terms of criteria, I mean, I, I get angry. I, here's a, I don't know if it's a difference uh, among lawyers, but when an insurance company treats my client a certain way without respect or yeah. something like that, that's how they're treating me. So I get angry. The damage is being done to me. Is it being done to me financially? Not to the same extent yeah. that it is to my client. But that's what matters to me. I want to hear from these clients that there's so much injustice that you know you don't care if you ever get paid. Right. You need to help the people. They, right. They're powerless. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Once you settle a case, for example, a bad faith disability income case, okay? Do you find the insurance companies come back and screw with your clients later on? Well, I mean, if you if settle, they, what they have is non, they have confidentiality clauses. Yeah. And a lot of the insurance companies will say in those clauses, not only can they not disclose, let's say, dollar amounts or that the case was settled, yeah. but another provision that they will put in is that they will never insure that client again. So that client can go to another employer, a different employer than where he, the first disability policy was through. Yeah. He can go to a whole new employer. And if that new employer has, let's say, Cigna, yeah. as we were talking about in this one gentleman's case, mm -hmm. he will not be insured. Now the employer is the one that's selecting the insurance company. Yeah, and if it's Cigna too, he's out of luck. That's right, even though the federal government is saying. And that's wrong too. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a lose-lose situation. Well, sure, the insurance company isn't admit, admitting liability yeah. in these confidentiality yeah. clauses, yet they're not allowing the client to ever be insured with them again. Yeah, what, what final remark do you want to give our audience regarding working with insurance companies and trying to deal with them when you have a policy and you need their help what's your words to them they really have to stay on top of it um, people that are physically in pain are not in good mental health yeah. uh, if they don't meet all the deadlines if they don't stay on top of their doctors yeah. to give out the reports they're 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 a lot of times their claim is going to be completely precluded because yeah. they've missed deadlines. Okay. And I don't want to sound like I'm advertising, but the sooner you get a lawyer yeah. that understands that Tells type of do. law, yeah. then the better off you're going to be because they're going to start getting the evidence in your favor. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for being with us today. We thank you. We enjoyed it. You really imparted a lot of good information, and uh, we'll be back. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.